The Clean Power Hour is brought to you by CPS America, the maker of North America's number one three-phase string inverter, with over six gigawatts shipped in the U.S. The CPS America product lineup includes three-phase string inverters ranging from 25 to 275 kW. Their flagship inverter, the CPS 250-275, is designed to work with solar plants ranging from 2 megawatts to 2 gigawatts. The 250-275 pairs well with CPS America's exceptional data communication, controls, and energy storage solutions. Go to chinpowersystems.com to find out more. We have an absolutely huge queue of people waiting for access to community solar. And on the corporate side of it, it's insatiable. I often use the analogy, we're selling a slice of bread, they want 10 bakeries. There is absolutely, we should be doing more of this. And and I, I believe the utility should be financially incentivized to interconnect these systems as quickly as possible. Are you speeding the energy transition? Here at the Clean Power Hour, our hosts Tim Montague and John Weaver bring you the best in solar, batteries, and clean technologies every week. Want to go deeper into decarbonization? We do too. We're here to help you understand and command the commercial, residential, and utility solar, wind, and storage industries. So let's get to it. Together we can speed the energy transition. Today on the Clean Power Hour, Community Solar 2.0. Most of my listeners know that here in the U.S. we have a burgeoning community solar market, but it really is only a great market in perhaps five growing into 10 states. And community solar is so important because it allows consumers and business owners who don't own their facility to partake in the solar market. And or renters or people with shady roofs, so many uh, subgroups that just cannot put solar on their facility, community solar is there for them. So I want to welcome Nate Owen, the founder and CEO of Ampion to the show. Welcome, Nate. Thank you, Tim. Very happy to be here. It's not often that I get to talk to such storied veterans in community solar, so uh, give our listeners a little background on yourself, though, Nate. How did you get interested in energy and then uh, this aspect of community solar? I have spent my entire career in the utility industry. I was fortunate enough to participate in the very early days of uh, deregulation. I kind of had a front row seat in the deregulated utility markets for about uh, 15 years and I've loved every second I've been in the industry. It's been an intellectual exercise and super fun. And uh, when I came across Community Solar, I absolutely fell head over heels for this product. So I have founded Ampion in 2014, and you know it was all about uh, you know building a platform, a software platform that could enable renewable energy to be provided to everyone everywhere. So uh, for the past 10 years, my company has spent a lot of time figuring out the complexities of consumer compliance and uh, community solar programs and interconnection challenges and just a a myriad of uh, what I call business development or or early evolutionary stages of of an industry. We've been dealing with that for a good 10 years. Um, And right now we're extremely excited because we see a a definitely a much more mature product, uh, one that is able to be provided to a much wider consumer base. And um, with the IRA, you know, guidance being figured out. We're very excited right now about uh, the community distributed generation industry. And if you, my listener, are not aware of the main flavor of community solar, there is a, a, a you know, there's a variety of, of ways that community solar comes to fruition, but the main model now in the United States is you create a state program like the Illinois Shines program, but these programs exist in half a dozen states, New Jersey, New York, Massachusetts, Maryland, uh, Maine, New Mexico, uh, where else? Here in the Midwest, Minnesota. Minnesota. 
Yeah, Minnesota Colorado. was a early adopter, um, and and then you you uh, funnel incentives from consumers into a pool, which then feed back into a program that makes it more affordable to produce clean energy in the form of a small utility solar array. So it's a central small utility facility, generally one to five megawatts AC. And these are, you know, five to 50 megawatt solar farms. And then consumers, depending on the state, what their geographic restrictions are, but within a couple of hundred miles, you could think of, right, consumers in some vicinity to these Projects can buy the electricity via virtual net metering. So the computers are accounting for the electricity. And that's what computers are really good for. And so it's it's a great way to allow consumers to participate, though, in, directly in the solar market. Of course, you have this phenomenon of, you know, in, in certainly in deregulated markets like Illinois, where there are 70 energy suppliers, or ARIES as they're called, and some of those areas are buying clean power, so to speak, from wind and solar projects around the country and then reselling that to their consumers. So there's a variety of ways that consumers can participate in the energy transition, but this is a very concrete one. And But, but Nate, it's been limited to states with these really robust programs. Every state is different. It must be quite challenging for companies like Ampion to manage all those flavors and you're dealing with, you know, consumers, you're dealing with businesses. These are IPPs, asset owners, right, who are building and owning uh, solar farms. And then you're also dealing with this huge variety from state to state. But would love to hear your general overview. And then what is Community Solar 2.0 in your mind? So one of the lessons I learned from operating in deregulated energy markets, which weirdly had a lot more standardization than we see in community solar markets today. You know, one of the things I learned is the value of standardization. And so there, you know, we spend an extraordinary amount of time and effort on creating standardization in our processes, in our language, in our contracts, because, you know, it's our, you know, we know that if the customer experience in with this particular product isn't good, it's no one's going to be successful in this industry. And so we spend a lot of time simplifying things, you know, standardizing, simplifying. And, you know, that was a strategy that worked um, in deregulated markets. And, you know, it is working in this particular segment as well. So, you know, that that's one way that we've been successful. I think, I don't know the exact number of markets that we are servicing customers in right now. I believe it's around 12 or 13, um, you know, and so you imagine that's on the order of 40 something utilities um, that's across multiple different programs, including in New York where you've got Massachusetts, you know, these old programs go through iterations of requirements in order to service um, portfolios. And so when you add all that up, it's an extraordinary amount of requirements, you know, including old programs that just don't work in some cases. Um, so, you know, we spent a lot of time and effort making sure that things as mundane as being able to get access to data in a standardized format and on a routine basis is done properly, not only by, you know, our company, but also other market participants, including utilities. So that's one, you know, one way we've worked um, to be able to scale this industry. It's something we were very proactive about in deregulated markets. And um, one thing as a market participant that you have to do in an industry that's young is actively participate in, you know, laying the groundwork for how the industry is going to work. You know, again, we spend a lot of time working with utilities and regulators on rules and uh, consumer protection and process requirements and contract requirements and all kinds of idiosyncratic nuts and bolts of the industry. I mean, talk about idiosyncrasies. One of the one of the nuances with community solar is that early on in a program, consumers are going to get a separate power bill when they subscribe to a community solar project. 
And then over time, uh, you will figure out a way to do on bill, and and then it's it's all coming on a, on a single bill. Um, and and I understand that there have been some fairly significant hiccups in different parts of the country around this, even when you're dealing with a single power bill. Sometimes consumers aren't getting credit for the community solar that they're buying. Um, but anyway, we want, to, we want to make this as easy as possible for all parties concerned, right? It's, it is truly a win-win for the United States when we green the grid. It's, it's good for our health. It's good for our sustainability. It's good for national security. It's good for jobs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the less friction we can have in the system, and let's face it, consumers don't like contracts. They don't like dealing with extra bills, and they 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 deal with their power bill because they have to, right? It's it's a must do. Got to have electricity, and and now you have a choice. That's great in in these markets. Um, but do you can you address this? Like, how is it working with the utilities and the regulatory bodies and is is it is it working? It is improving. Yes, it is working, and it's actually getting better and better all the time. There, are, you know, there are a lot of people, a lot of people in my company that are doing a lot of the grunt work. You know, we we you know work with public utility commissions and utilities all the time on improvement in process and timing and all kinds of things. And in fact, there's a lot of utilities right now that are upgrading their billing systems, you know, in the moment um, because you know the the influx of distributed generation is forcing a lot of these archaic billing systems of the past to to struggle. In fact, you know, we we think the utility billing system um, is one of the single largest impediments to the um, to the deployment of large scale amounts of renewable energy. Um, the good news is that we are starting to see utilities upgrade those billing systems. Um, the bad news, you know, is that they struggle a lot. They, those are those are old systems that can cost hundreds of millions of dollars to implement over the years. So. Um, I will say that things are getting much better, you know, and I, I went through the same thing in DREG, you know, when, when we had the first couple of years, um, you know, people were figuring out process and data communications protocols and, you know, exception resolution situations, how to read, you know, all meters in a deregulated marketplace, all, you know, all the, the challenges that one might expect when a big industry all of a sudden goes from a monopoly service to being serviced by, you know, 200 different companies. Um, so I'm seeing improvements all the time. And and the models that are being Im 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 implemented later on by states that are taking on the, these, that are implementing new programs, they are definitively taking from programs that have been implemented elsewhere and have worked. So that's a, that's a very positive um, development. But, you know, the reality is that I think renewables can't wait for regulators to figure everything out. And I'm starting to see the industry uh, outrun uh, the regulatory regimes and the utilities. Um, you know, we are starting to see community solar models, you know, wherein there's this notion of shared benefit rather than, you know, one, hey, one large, huge offtaker on a 200 megawatt PPA. We're starting to hear and see a lot of talk about applying the principal constructs of community solar or community distributed generation to assets larger than than five megawatts. And I'm, I'm excited about that because mm. uh, if in fact we can start to build out this community construct, but at the scale of 10 or 20, maybe even 50 megawatts, I see the product reaching or accelerating very significantly. Cool. Uh, I yeah, I would love to lean into this. What is the next generation of community solar? In the pre-show, we were talking a little bit about the rec market here in Illinois, otherwise known mm. as Illinois Shines or the Adjustable Block Program. Those rec values are what really jumpstart the solar industry, right? In mm. residential, the recs might be seventy dollars a megawatt hour or seven cents a kWh. In commercial industrial, they might be four cents a kWh. Well, an industrial user is paying four cents 
And so when they could buy uh, solar power for two cents, right, all of a sudden this makes tremendous sense. And they, and they, will, and they will invest in a solar facility when they can, they can get a discount by buying solar power. But money talks, and and you know the the can will get kicked down the road if it, if it doesn't save a customer money, they're not going to do it uh, nine out of ten times. So th- there's there's that there's these programs and ways to step outside of them or run faster, as you would say. And then there's also the advent of storage. So uh, let's let's go more into the future of community solar. What does that look like? Um. I mean, I see, you know, when we're talking about future, I'm looking out, say, a year or two, but we're already seeing this. Corporate America's motivated to be in the community solar construct. Um, you know, they very much want to participate. We've seen that for years. And it's not something people think of uh, when they think of community solar necessarily. But, you know, in Illinois, for example, um, there is the option to do community solar outside of the Illinois Shines program. And we have seen a very significant amount of business in seeking to develop assets outside of the ABP program or the adjustable block program. And primarily, you know, the benefit of participating in the ABP program is the, is the rent contract and, the, you know, the guaranteed revenue over a certain period of time at a certain rate. Developing outside of that program means that you need to, you know, monetize those recs somewhere else. And we've seen an appetite on on the behalf of corporate America, at least in some service territories, or at least at some rates, uh, where they're interested in not only being a subscriber to a portfolio, but also, um, you know, taking a lower discount or paying uh, and a, a premium, if you will, for the recs associated with the projects and thus being able to, to take the benefit of, of additionality. And we're seeing a lot more of that. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, for the next several years, uh, there's going to be an insatiable appetite from not just, you know, the Fortune 500 or 1000, but really the entire business community, the mush community, um, the investment community. Um, to get not only onto these sites to save money, as you said, but also um, to start to participate at a large scale, uh, be the anchor customers. We're already seeing um, large corporates, you know, signing contracts. And soon after the contract is executed, the portfolio is financed. Um, And we're seeing a lot of that these days. You know, I think a lot of portfolios in the future are going to be, um, they have the potential to be above five megawatts. Hopefully that cap starts to fade away a little bit. Um, and also I hope that, um, you know, we start to see um, the balance sheet of corporate America come into the equation and, and you know, also, you know, nonprofit America come into the equation, not only benefit from the product, but also potentially um, investing in it as well. And the IRA certainly, you know, uh, promotes that in a big way. So do me a favor and distinguish, if you would, a, a 50 megawatt community solar project from a 50 megawatt uh, virtual well, P- virtual PPA that has a single off taker, say a data center or something like that. Though, because community solar, its roots are smaller distributed projects across the landscape. And servicing yeah. multiple off takers. I mean, in Illinois, the rule is as mi- as few as four off takers, but as many as hundreds. And mm-hmm. is that is that different in your in your example though of a larger community solar project? Well, the, the first of all, the most community solar projects are five megawatts and below. The only state that allows more than a five megawatt facility uh, off the top of my head is the California program, which, you know, is really up in the air right now. So yes, it is. I can't even say that I can't even say that they still allow for a 20 megawatt facility. Um, so I think every state that we are in um, five megawatts is the um, largest size. And, um, you know, Here's what's really interesting about community solar vis-a-vis a a large-scale virtual power purchase agreement or even a behind-the-meter sort of um, installation. Um, You know, 
community has the benefit of replaceability and it's all about risk. And I hear this routinely from the people that we work with. Um, the very large projects are um, can be risky. And we've seen that over and over again. Just recently, the the utility scale projects in New York, you know, it, it's my understanding that that if they haven't been pulled off the table, um, they're near being pulled off the table uh, because, you know, margins were so tight or, you know, the economics didn't work in those uh, contracts. And I've talked to numerous corporate um, off takers and others who just say, you know, they don't want to spend a year or two negotiating a contract at the CFO level to engage in a, and then end up two or three year late, years later getting the benefit of that um, F, that development effort. Um, community is just a lot easier than that. And we've seen a lot of capacity come to market in states like Massachusetts, Maine, Illinois, pretty much anywhere you look. Um, there's a line of capacity coming. It's a very popular product, not only from the consumer side of the equation, but also from the investor side of the equation, because you're, you're working with multiple off takers. And so your risk that one of those is going to go bankrupt or one of those who knows what's going to happen to them. I mean, we, you know, a couple of years ago, we had a hospital that got hacked and lost their investment grade rating over the course of a weekend, something like that. You know, so there's always risk in these contracts. The ability to bring in multiple off takers of all ilk, we can put low to moderate income customers on them as subscribers. We can put some of the, you know, we can, in some states, put very large facilities onto these solar farms. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility there. You know, you know, there's a lot of contract flexibility. You know, a lot of these larger VPPAs are, you know, 20, 25 years. Um, you know, in in the community solar world, you know, corporate offtake, depending on credit rating, you can sign a 10 year contract. Sometimes it's 15 years contract. Sometimes it's 20 year contracts. So, you know, the I was at a conference focused on financing of, you know, renewable energy financing. Uh, this is about six months ago. And I was very interested to hear that community solar was one of the most bankable product offerings or financeable product offerings that existed in the renewable space. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, you know, that that's a big change from where we were eight to 10 years ago when financiers didn't, you know, some understood it, uh, but not everybody did. And now what they've realized is that, you know, it's, it's a mutually beneficial product that is, I think a little bit easier to develop than larger scale or behind the, the uh, meter systems. And most importantly, it has a feature of replaceability, right? If someone goes bankrupt, um, if someone, if a residential consumer, God forbid, passes away or moves out of a utility service territory, sure. we can take them off of the site usually in a month. You cannot uninstall, you know, systems from a rooftop and you can't, yeah. You just can't do these types of things in the behind the meter or utility scale. So, so what I what I hear you saying is it's the marketplace aspect of this, right? You, you Ampion is is a, is a matchmaker, right? It it takes off takers and and gives them access to the the KWH from a myriad of projects and mm -hmm. depending on what it is that they're looking for, they they will have some choice. Um, but it, it, it also, you know, it begs the question, are we building enough community solar, right? Like there are limits to these programs, let's say roughly 250 megawatts a year here in Illinois of traditional community solar and, and, and then maybe another 50 of, of low and moderate income through Illinois solar for all. And, and the, you know, the actual demand from consumers and business owners is, is probably 10x that or something like that. We have an absolutely huge queue of people waiting for access to community solar. And on the corporate side of it, it's insatiable. I often use the analogy, we're selling a slice of bread, they want 10 bakeries. There is 
absolutely we should be doing more of this. And, and I, I believe the utilities should be financially incentivized to interconnect these systems as quickly as possible. You know, I think ERCOT has figured it out. I don't know all the things, everything about ERCOT interconnection um, rules, but they have seem to have interconnected, you know, a hundred times more than anybody else out there. The, the critical distinction is that we need to start thinking of community solar farms as requiring storage on them because, um, you know, they, they need to be power plants. They need to have some dispatchability. They need to provide value sure. um, on, you know, days when the sun's not shining or hours when the sun's not shining. Yep. And, it, you know, it's just my belief that there should be um, an absolutely massive effort to build community solar farms everywhere. You know, and it's not just solar farms. It's, you know, standalone storage. It's, uh, um, and it, it can be large, it can be small, it can be potential, you know, fuel cells, community hydro. They're, the model works, the construct works. Like we see it work. We see it work in Massachusetts and New York and Maine and, and actually everywhere it's working, despite the fact that utilities can be slow and not totally attuned to the requirements, you know, all the time. Um, but I absolutely, I think we should be doing more of this. You know, I think the states that have done it have really proven it. Proven it. Illinois is one of them. The Clean Power Hour is brought to you by CPS America, the maker of North America's number one three-phase string inverter with over six gigawatts shipped in the U.S. The CPS America product lineup includes three-phase string inverters ranging from 25 to 275 kW. Their flagship inverter, the CPS 250-275, is designed to work with solar plants ranging from 2 megawatts to 2 gigawatts. The 250-275 pairs well with CPS America's exceptional data communication, controls, and energy storage solutions. Go to chintpowersystems.com to find out more. So uh, let's I'd... let's talk about solar and storage and then storage alone. It's still it's still small potatoes, the number of community solar projects that have storage attached to them. And but, you know, now in some states, there are specific incentives for storage. And of course, there's the the IRA incentives, which is, you know, lowering the cost of, of clean energy across the board. But but how does that let you know, one of the. One of the promises of community solar is a 10 or 20% savings to the consumer. Okay, so in Illinois, that's great. Now you throw in storage to the equation. It's a, it's a much more valuable asset. It, 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 it has a layer, uh, a value stack, right? And how does that uh, affect the, the value for the consumer, though? The battery is interesting. Um, and I'll talk about uh, New York because that's just today what I'm most familiar with. Sure. Um, you know, Con Ed has a, um, a battery program. Beater has a, an option for batteries um, in it. And, you know, as you might expect, the batteries are um, providing power during peak hours, uh, 200 uh, peak hours of the summer month between May and September, I think, or June and September. I forget the specific day. So, so they're obviously they're contributing to system reliability in the city during peak hours. And so, as you might expect, the value of those kilowatt hours, discharge kilowatt hours, is pretty high. Um, and in fact, I heard from one developer um, that all in. And this, I think of this particular individual and company as the Leonardo da Vinci of development. Um, he was telling me I put together a project that was apparently worth a dollar thirty-eight cents per kilowatt hour, mm. um, and I thought, "Wow, how did we do that?" Yeah, that's a lot. Um, but you know, those are, those are Con Ed rates, DRV. Who knows if the LSRV was involved? Um, you know, ba- batteries are extremely valuable in Con Ed service territory in New York City. So um, and that might be a five X over just the value of solar electrons or something like that, right? Uh, I'm going to guess. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, Veter probably in Con Ed is you know in the twenties, uh, pretty you know all the time. Um, I mm-hmm. haven't looked at it recently, but that's how I think of Con Ed is, mm-hmm. you know, one of the most expensive 
markets in the country. But if you're pulling in a dollar forty per kilowatt hour, yeah, I'd oh. say you're getting, um, oh. yeah, five, four to five times. And I and um, I've heard whisperings but, of but, of uh, you know like five megawatt hour batteries in New York. So just storage alone. Is that a is that a community solar play or what is what what's going on with storage alone? Yeah, I mean they're considered community distributed generation, mm -hmm. um, and so we have standalone batteries right now that are, you know, community solar, community storage farms. Um, they produce a monetary value, and we can discount that value um under a long-term contract with in you know these cases um a corporate subscriber um and so we've been you know putting large corporations uh onto solar farms with batteries and now we're doing it on standalone storage facilities and it is different um because basically because you know the kilowatt hour that's coming out of a community solar farm while you know the richest kilowatt hours if you will across the country typically because the it's generation that's that's uh closer to load um the 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 monetary value of um storage is very significant so you have to find the, the appropriate off takers for that type of um portfolio because uh you need to have the right types of subscribers with the right consumption profiles. Um, and um, they're, you know, 40, I think a very significant percentage of the value of a, uh, one of these, you know, standalone storage facilities is generated in 200 hours of the summer. So for some facilities, you could be generating um, you know, potentially 80% of the value of a facility in June, July, August, and September. Yeah. So in, in, unless you're going to go through some uh, different billing paradigms, you you know, you might have to find someone who can make some big payments in those months or can meet the, con the payment terms. And, you know, you might go, well, how is this greening the grid if we're just installing batteries? And, and I go, well... First of all, you could you could be uh, charging that battery with a utility solar farm um, to make it economical, or your battery is simply replacing coal fired or natural gas fired generation. Um, so I guess that's the that's a question. Has somebody done the math on if we replace natural gas peaker plants with batteries? Is the is the carbon footprint lower of that asset? Do we know? Um, if we replace natural gas plants with batteries, yeah, is it? You know, I quite honestly am not the expert on that type of topic. I mean, no intuitively, um, I mean, well, specifically, you know, there are things like Local Law ninety seven, which we believe um, does allow you know building owners in New York City to avoid penalties commensurate with the amount of um, offtake they get from an offsite battery. Mm. So I do believe that, um, you know, batteries are a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Sure. They're not perfect. Some people are going to charge them with grid power in during peak hours potentially, but the reality is, you know, they're a vehicle and you need it to enable renewable energy. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm not making the distinction on, you know, is this better than a natural gas plant? I know it's better than a natural gas plant, yeah. um, provided it's manufactured responsibly and, you know, the safety ratings are fine and all that jazz. Uh, I'm comfortable with it. Yeah, I can't remember the exact statistics, but when you, can, when you look at an internal combustion engine vehicle versus a battery-powered vehicle, uh, the carbon, the the lifetime carbon footprint of that EV is substantially lower than the ICE engine vehicle, all thing you know, all in, uh, by a factor of two at least, and I think it goes as high as a factor of five. So, so we are greening the yeah. grid with batteries, and and they they do have a lower carbon footprint. I don't know the exact statistics. You, my listener, may know. So please send me some links if you if you know of a good quantification of 
of grid scale batteries, but uh, you know the carbon footprint of grid scale batteries. So, Nate, what else should our listeners know about you know the evolution of community solar? What is what is you what are you excited about, and what is keeping you up at night? Um, well, I mean, the Cal- California's decision a few weeks ago was baffling. Yes, it was. You know, I think it's really important for people to understand how um, just uh, disconcerting it is. You know, someone in my company pointed out a few months ago that the California utilities had, um, I think, you know, pointed to the state of Maine as a case study for challenges uh, with community solar programs. And, you know, for the for for the people that, you know, we have our sleeves rolled up in this every single day. That was really shocking to see the state of California's utilities pointing at the state of Maine and, um, you know, saying, well, the state of Maine has had some challenges. So, you know, we expect to have significant challenges. So we're, we're, and, you know, well, we're recording here in, in late March. Give our paint a picture, though, of what's the deal with community solar in California, because California is a nascent community solar market still, even though it's a very mature solar market. It's it's a bit of a laggard in the community solar space. But what's the what's the situation and why are you baffled by the CPUC's recent decision? Well, um, the SB 43 was California's foray into community solar in 2014. And um, it, quite honestly, it's what got me hooked on community solar. Because when I read about it, I, I was just, you know, floored and excited. Um, so California had the first program. And unfortunately, it was not structured very well. You know, for example, you know, they the California program required um, customers that signed up for community solar to, to, to pay a departing load charge. And they weren't departing load. Um, so, you know, it made it very difficult for people to look at a community solar contract and say, okay, I'm going to pay an additional two or three cents to go on a community solar farm um, rather than staying with my utility. And so that persisted for a bunch of years. And actually, a few years ago, um, we made the decision to get into California and brought the first community solar farm. Uh, to COD last summer, I believe, um, in SCE service territory, invested a couple years uh, working on the whole program and found California to be a market full of people that wanted to do this. Um, You know, not, you know, um, just like New York and Massachusetts and Maine and everywhere else, you know, we're finding a growing population of people that once they understand the product, they are absolutely demanding it and who wouldn't want it? So there was a lot of investment, at least from my company into the California market and several other people went through SCE's auction last year um, to bring portfolios to market. Um, but unfortunately, the, the administrative law judge um, decided that um, the programs that had been in place hadn't been just or fair and thus, a new program should be implemented, which which provides a revenue model similar to PURPA, um, you know, qualified facility revenue model. Um, and I think this is one of the first times we've seen this in any community solar market, where the power that is produced by these solar farms that are extremely valuable to local communities is being valued at, um, you know, wholesale locational marginal prices or, mm-hmm. you know, um, cost, you know, uh, at very low rates associated with like allocation, you know, cost allocation models. We usually see community solar incentivized in some way. Maybe it's through a volumetric rate where, you know, if you subscribe to a solar farm, you get a kilowatt hour of value, the same that you would be charged by the utility. Well, if that happened in California, these solar farms would be being built left and right, but instead they're treating these solar farms as essentially PURPA assets. Um, And that's not going to provide a lot of room or incentive economically for people to operate in the California market. That said, the IRA is uh, providing incentives and, you know, equipment costs right now are pretty low. So, but I think, you know, it's important to understand that California 
And the California Public Utility Commission, for a baffling reason, just, you know, went further in, in stymieing development efforts there. And I, I mean, I'm telling you, they're losing out on, I think, billions of dollars of incentives and development. I mean, you know, I often talk about this in states that um, like Maine or Massachusetts, Massachusetts, those states are full of little shiny generators that are prov providing local power without pollution to communities all over these states. And they're financed by third parties largely. And why in the world would you not want that? Uh, it just doesn't make any sense to me with the California Public Utility Commission. Or Plus the, coming the, on, the, the on the coattails of, of NEM 3.0, which basically oh. collapsed the residential market. It, it Tim, really... I mean, what's the, ex I, do you, I, I can only, I don't know. I mean, how do you, how do you explain this? I don't understand. It seems to me the CPUC has, has lost its way. Uh, I don't know what, what the roots of that are. I'm jaded. I, I think of, uh, you know, uh, being captured by some evil empire. But anyway, um, we're almost out of time. Nate, I would love to to hear a little more about kind of where where the puck is going, like where, where are you guys leaning into the future of community solar? What markets are you paying special attention to that are emerging markets? There are several emerging markets, you know, and for us, you know, we see a whole, okay. So, you know, there are batteries, uh, as we've already discussed, I see as a very big growth opportunity for the entire industry. But, you know, there's also, there's been a lot going on in the states of New York. You know, Massachusetts, um, Maine has, has been very active for the past few years and will continue to be active. Uh, we are seeing rumblings across our home state of Massachusetts, which we love to hear. The states of Minnesota, Colorado, Illinois continues to be very active. So, and, you know, again, we, we're starting to see this community solar construct be applied, you know, outside of the community solar programs. And I just, I firmly believe that we're going to start to see the, the community solar construct, i.e., you know, multiple off takers on distributed generation assets. I think that's going to be the predominant model from now on. You know, I think there's huge benefit to for numerous larger entities to share the benefits to LMI customers in their local areas. We're seeing a lot of uh, hospitals, municipalities, uh, corporate America wanting to invest in LMI communities, and we have we've been uh, providing significant benefit to LMI customers for years, and we're continuing to see growth in that particular segment. So. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited about our space right now. It's uh, it seems like there's just uh, endless opportunities going, at least in the states that have uh, forward thinking regulations and utilities that want to participate in this transition. Yep. Well, check out all of our content at cleanpowerhour.com. Give us a rating and a review on Apple and Spotify. Please tell a friend about the show. Reach out to me on LinkedIn. I love hearing from my listeners. Uh, or contact me at the website and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Nate, how can our listeners find you? Uh, Ampion.net, or <laughs> you can email me, I guess. Uh, I'm at noen at Ampion.net. Yeah, I love talking about the industry, too. Great. Well, thank you so much, Nate Owen, CEO and founder of Ampion, for coming on the show today. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Tim. Greatly appreciated. I'm Tim Montague. Let's grow solar and storage. Hey, listeners. This is Tim. I want to give a shout out to all of you. I do this for you twice a week. Thank you for being here. Thank you for giving us your time. I really appreciate you and what you're all about uh, you are part and parcel of the energy transition, whether you're an energy professional today or an aspiring energy professional. So thank you. I want to let you know that the Clean Power Hour has launched a listener survey, and it would mean so much to me if you would go to cleanpowerhour.com, click on the About Us link, 
right there on the main navigation that takes you to the about page and you'll see a big graphic listener survey just click on that graphic and it takes just a couple of minutes if you fill out the survey i will send you a lovely baseball cap with our logo on it the other thing i want our listeners to know is that this podcast is made possible by corporate sponsors we have chin power systems the leading three-phase string inverter manufacturer in north america so check out cps america but we are very actively looking for additional support to make this show work and you see here our media kit with all the sponsor benefits and statistics about the show you know we're dropping two episodes a week we have now over 320,000 downloads on YouTube, and we're getting about 45,000 downloads per month. So this is a great way to bring your brand to our listeners, and our listeners are decision makers in clean energy. This includes project executives, engineers, finance, project management, and many other professionals who are making decisions about and developing, designing, installing, and making possible clean energy projects. So check out cleanpowerhour.com, both our listener survey on the About Us and our media kit, and become a sponsor today. Thank you so much. Let's grow solar and storage. The Clean Power Hour is brought to you by CPS America the maker of North America's number one three-phase string inverter, with over six gigawatts shipped in the U.S. The CPS America product lineup includes three-phase string inverters ranging from 25 to 275 kW. Their flagship inverter, the CPS 250-275, is designed to work with solar plants ranging from 2 megawatts to 2 gigawatts. The 250-275 pairs well with CPS America's exceptional data communication, controls, and energy storage solutions. Go to chintpowersystems.com to find out more.